Good evening, everyone. Please welcome your host for this evening, award-winning author and performer, Catherine Hernandez. Good evening, my friends. Y'all are looking so good tonight. Give yourself a round of applause for looking so cute. Shut up. Shut up. My name is Catherine Hernandez. I'm the author of Scarrow, the book, and, and uh, it sort of reminds me of this room glasses cupboard saying. So instead of just acknowledging the original and current caretakers of this stolen land, documented and undocumented, let's make it a call to action. As storytellers, let's read the next form. Yeah, that's right, you clap. <laughs> if you're clapping, I'm gonna check if you're gonna do something, okay? So who is ready to celebrate some books tonight? Yeah, you ready? Y'all got juiced up in the, in the little bar over there? You guys are ready for books? <laughs> and as you can see, I'm as cool as a cucumber tonight. They said it was business casual. Do it look like I mean business? Do I? <laughs> business casual, yeah, right. <laughs> but I really am as cool as a cucumber. And not really, it's that any perspiration you see is just perimenopause. <laughs> and not nerves. Trust me, you have no idea how many ice packs are underneath my dress just to maintain this healthy glow. Right, this is 42, y'all. But you know why I'm so relaxed? It's because I'm not shortlisted. <laughs> right? Okay, having been shortlisted several times, I have to say it's simultaneously feeling this right now. Especially when like, the host just drones on and on and on and on and on, trying to make light of this momentous occasion that might be the turning point of your career, right? No pressure. My fave ceremonies are the ones where dinner is served before that turn to everyone tell me, please tell me, did they win, did they win? You know, and like you want to drink because it will help lubricate all those loser feelings. But if you win, you may slur your entire acceptance speech. He said, he reassured me that being shortlisted already changed the trajectory of my career. And he was right. Did I mention there's a movie of my book? Yeah, right? That's right, it's like, you know, if you can imagine David with like a beard and a staff, just don't worry, be happy, right? In the spirit of David's advice, I wanted to do a quick exercise for all of the shortlisters here tonight, sort of like a group meditation. I think there should be more group meditations at award ceremonies. Like, I have so many ideas about how to improve Canlit, including shortlisters fighting it out in a blood sport type setup, right? And I mean, like, blah, 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 character arc, blah, 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 storyline, and Canlit MMA is where it's at. Think of the pay-per-view revenue we would garner. Just think of it. Just think of it. Put a pin in it for now. Okay, anyways, if you're a shortlister, can you place a hand on your heart? And those of us who aren't shortlisted can send them all of our energy and love. And close your eyes if you want to. Mm-hmm. And or focus on a point in the distance. Okay, and ground yourself and breathe. And listen to my voice. It's okay if I don't win. <laughs> I've accomplished so much and I've gotten this far. I will not die. <laughs> I am not a loser. Although, <laughs> it would be kind of nice to win <laughs> and make rent and not have to return this dress which still has a tag on it, in case I have to return it. And what does David Cherry Andy know about losing anyway? 
I mean, come on. Thank you for indulging me. I know some of you really went there. You really went there. And thanks for playing Happen. And thank you as well to you, our guests, for joining us for tonight's celebration of Canadian... Thank you, Catherine, for hosting tonight and for being an impossible act to follow. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of the board and the staff of the Writers' Trust. Anybody. When I was set to meet someone new, I often went to our program director, James Davies, for intel on the person I was about to encounter. I chose James because he's been at the Writers Trust for so long that he knows everybody, but also because he has an uncanny ability to capture a person's essence in a single phrase, a phrase which is often funny and tends to have a very cutting edge. And so a few weeks into the job, I'm going to meet Graham Gibson for the first time. I pop into James's office and ask him, what is Graham Gibson like? And he pauses and he says, he's sort of like a saint. I'm sure there are many people in this room. This was a small act of defiance among his many significant and successful efforts to make life better for Canadian writers and to make our literature better for Canadian readers. Graham was the acclaimed author of four novels and three books of nonfiction. Through his activism and his rare ability to rally the people around him for the causes he believed in, he also became a champion for his fellow writers. June Colwood referred to him as the spark plug of all of the major literary organizations in Canada. It was Graham who conceived of the Writers Trust as an organization that would support Canadian writers, promote their work, and put money directly in their hands. He co-founded the Trust in 1976 with Margaret Atwood, Pierre Burton, Margaret Lawrence, and David Young. He served as our first chair and as a board member for 12 years. In many of its early years, the Writers' Trust sailed on choppy waters, and Graham played a greater role than anyone in keeping it afloat, and also in making it thrive. Graham was also a founding member and chair of both the Writers' Union of Canada and Penn Canada, and a co-chair of the Book and Periodical Council. An avid conservationist and devoted birder, Graham was as committed to the environment as he was to the writing community. He played a leading role in the beginnings of the Pelee Island Bird Observatory and was a council member of World Wildlife Fund Canada. In 1992, for his contributions to Canadian society, Graham was inducted as a member of the Order of Canada. Graham bought, brought humility, charm, humor, and grace to every encounter, and all of us at the Writers' Trust were delighted at every opportunity to cross paths with him whether it was at an awards, like t an awards night like tonight or at a Writers' Trust gala with Margaret always at his side, or at a committee meeting where his opinion, however gently expressed, seemed always to have the power to carry the day. We are full of gratitude for the legacy Graham Gibson has left to Canadian writers who will forever benefit from his generosity of spirit. He was a towering figure and we are lucky to have had him walk among us and the birds, living his honorable, dignified, and meaningful life. Hope is an attitude. Hope is an attitude. Both optimism and pessimism are merely states of mind, right? There is uh, uh, reasons to hope and reasons for hope. Now, there are innumerable reasons to hope for one's own sanity, for example, for one's sense of one's uh, responsibility. But for hope, yeah. uh, is the hope justified? That's not so clear. I mean, but then again, we all live as if we're immortal. We all, I mean, we live through our lives as if we're immortal, as if we're not going to die. And we're going to die. We've got to live our lives as, as well as we can, as responsibly as we can, as enjoyably as we can. So we might as well also live as if we can really make a difference. The 
Hope is an attitude. Writers Trust would like to thank White Pine Pictures for that lovely tribute to Graham Gibson. This evening's first prize was a project Graham Gibson was deeply involved with. To present the Matt Cohen Award in celebration of a writing life, I'd like to introduce the founder of Groundwood Books and the partner to whom this prize was named. Please welcome Patsy Aldana. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to say more about Graham in a minute. For 19 years, the Matt Cohen Award has been presented to a Canadian writer who has lived their writing life. That is, made their living completely by writing. Hasn't had a job, hasn't, doesn't have a pension. The award is given for literary excellence, a kind of lifetime achievement prize, and arrives with $25,000. The prize is for writing, the money is so that the writer can continue to live the writing life. The award is presented in memory of Matt Cohen, who was a strong supporter of Canadian literature. He was the author of more than 30 books, a founding member of the Writers' Union of Canada, a lead advocate in creating this country's public lending right program, and an internationally celebrated writer who helped put Canada on the world literary map. Upon his death in 1999, 20 years ago, the Writers' Trust created an award in Matt's name for a writer who has made a significant and lasting contribution to Canadian literature. I was pleased to serve on this year's selection committee along with Graham Gibson, Wayne Grady, and Don Oravec. I first met my dear friend Graham in 1975 when I was just starting to work in publishing. We were on a committee of the Independent Publishers Association, soon to become the ACP. He was working on organizing the Writers' Trust then from an office somewhere in the Lothian Muse, if you can remember that far back. It was so cute, the Lothian Muse. He kind of took me under his wing and taught me a lot about the struggle to create and sustain a Canadian-owned publishing industry, and maybe even more about Canadian nationalism and writers. As I was Guatemalan and had chosen to come to Canada without really knowing much about it, it was great to learn about what was then a very enthralling and thrilling adventure of creation of Canadian writing and, and publishing. And of course, one of the writers he told me about was Matt Cohen. The last time I saw Graham, we had lunch together this past summer to talk about this year's Matt Cohen Award. We went to our favorite restaurant, The Select, and our conversation turned to the problem of writers who are less visible in this country, indigenous writers, minority writers, that even though they were being published more than now than they had been in the past, it was still far from an equal playing field. And then we turned to the writers who are even more invisible right now in Canada, writers, mainly immigrants, who write in languages that aren't the official languages. They're not writing in French or English. Given how difficult it is in today's world to be translated into English, few of us know about some of the very, very distinguished writers who live amongst us and who are writing major works that we know nothing about and none of us has read. And we talked about how difficult that must be. The marvelous thing about Graham was that he really cared not only about birds and trees and nature and his wonderful family, but about other people. He was a, really a caregiving person, especially people who, having chosen to live a writing life, have often paid a steep price, even as they have created the wondrous and essential books that enrich our lives. Now, Before announcing this year's winner, I want to take a moment to thank two individuals without whom this award would not be possible. Mar Marla and David Lieberg, I don't know if you're here. Are you here? They're there. Without... <laughs> what a wonder it was for this prize when you two joined it and supported it. They are a very special couple, passionate readers, generous philanthropists. We're fortunate to have them involved with the prize. They have a deep passion for the work of Canadian writers, and tonight marks the 10th anniversary of their support. On behalf of the Writers' Trust and the writers who have benefited from your support, thank you. Please.
Let me tell you a little bit about this year's recip uh, recipient before inviting her to the stage. This is a very difficult award to choose, and um, we're very happy to announce that the winner of the 2019 Matt Cohen Award is Olive Senior. Olive Senior truly exemplifies the writing life. She left her native Jamaica in 1989, intending to take a year off to write. That year became two and then three, and now she has been living in Toronto, supporting herself with her writing for 26 years. Since her first book of short stories, Summer Lightning and Other Stories, came out in 1986, winning her first Commonwealth Writers Prize. She has explored her own Caribbean roots and the lingering effects of col colonialism on modern Caribbean society. Her stories are rich and compassionate, and beneath their straightforward surfaces lurk the darker hints of what one critic has termed the complex seduction of the victim after colonization. One of the jurors remarked that a single line in Olive Senior's novel, Dancing Lessons, for it is only in other people's gaze that we see ourselves, isn't it? changed my perspective on life, and I never forgot it. In all her books, from her collection of poems, Shell, shortlisted for the Pat Lowther Award, to books of stories, such as The Discerner of Hearts and The Pain Tree, Olive Zenier has examined the roles of race and class in the world's ever-shifting hierarchies. By bringing to light the complex and sometimes opposing effects of colonialism on the lives of the colonized, for example, her work is now at the center of one of the most important issues in Canadian literature and in our life as Canadians. Through her poetry, fiction and nonfiction, Olive Senior is devoted to ensuring that the voices of women, especially those of the Caribbean diaspora, have continued to be heard. I've been meandering across borders all my life, she has said, and that cross-cultural perspective is what gives her work its refreshing, eye-opening, life-changing relevance. Ladies and gentlemen, please, jo please join us in welcoming to the stage Olive Senior. I'm a bit overwhelmed by this, as I tend to be, when I'm not writing something down. But I just want to say thank you to the Writers' Trust and to the sponsors for recognizing that writers need to be fed. And if we're not, we'll chew our nails and we'll chew our manuscripts <laughs> and so on. So I, I'm deeply honored by um, this selection for the Matt Cohen Award. And, um, to me, it's a justification for the decision I made at the age of four that I was going to be a writer. So thank you all very much. Thank you. To present tonight's second career award, the Writers' Trust Vicki Metcalf Award for Literature for Young People, please welcome a past children's book columnist for the Globe and Mail, former member of the Writers' Trust Board of Directors and juror for this year's prize, Susan Perrin. Thank you, Catherine. More than 50 years ago, Vicki Metcalf created a prize to celebrate the writing of literature for Canadian children, a prize that would honor writers who took creative risks and demonstrated sustained excellence throughout their careers. She recognized that a community of writers for children that is strong, vibrant, and imaginative would help foster a healthy community of readers, that these writers would instill a love of literature at an early age and create lifelong readers. 
On behalf of the Writers' Trust, I am grateful to the Metcalf Foundation for making this $25,000 award possible. I am thrilled that this award, celebrating the confluence of young people, writers, and creativity, is included among tonight's prizes, signaling, signaling that remarkable artistry is required to write well, whether for an audience of young children, teenagers, or adults. I was lucky to serve on this year's jury alongside Glenn Huser and Keo McClear, who are two of the most careful and thoughtful readers I've had the pleasure to work with. And now to the recipient of this year's award. Tonight's winner has deftly managed to mold unforgettable characters that lead us in and out of the seismic shifts of adolescence in the earthquake zone of Vancouver, where her stories are set. She celebrates the amazing resilience of young people, as well as the adults around them, as they face such trials as mental health issues, bullying, homelessness, and the deaths of siblings and parents. Few writing today can match her ability to make even peripheral characters memorable through a wonderful distillation of dialogue and details. A testimony to her talent is that she manages to put everything together with a humor that can only draw us in and keep us laughing, even as we reach for a box of tissues. Witty, tender, fearless in the face of tackling big issues, this author has staked out her territory in children's literature, and it's a place worth visiting often. The winner of the 2019 Vicki Metcalf Award for Literature for Young People is Susan Nielsen. Bravo. Oh my God, you know, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm one of the lucky ones because like I knew ahead of time, right? Whew, but it uh, still makes you feel a little bit verklempt. Um, I, um, I actually carried this with me from Vancouver. It's the first diary I ever kept. Uh, I was 11. On the inside cover, it says, Susan Nielsen, the spy because uh, I wanted to be like Harriet, and I tried to spy on my neighbors. Most of it is blank, because I was uh, a real rule follower, and I thought it was important to start on the date that was printed at the top of the page. <laughs> Graham Gibson wouldn't have been happy, because I murdered a tree. But um, I, I'm just going to read you the opening paragraph. This is the first day I've really written in a diary. The reason I am is because I love writing stories, and if I do grow up to be a famous writer, and later die, and they want to get a story of my life, I guess I should keep a diary. <laughs> so, you know, 55-year-old me, um, I keep thinking that, like, Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway and Jimmy Kimmel are about to come out and say there's been a terrible mistake. Uh, Moonlight actually won, and they're going to, like... <laughs> Uh, pull me from the stage, um, but I, it's so funny because I think my 11-year-old self would be going, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> I was thinking what I wouldn't give to still have that level of confidence. Um, I have written for young people much of my life. I started with a TV show called Degrassi Junior High. Yeah. Uh, I love writing for this age group. It's a time of first, a time of figuring out your place in the world. Um, my novels feature protagonists who don't quite fit, but often have really glass-half-full attitudes. And um, why, you ask? Well, allow me to read you one more short paragraph. <laughs> I've praised here. I just moved to London, Ontario about three months ago. I don't have any friends, but I don't mind. My cat's a friend, and so's my doll, Raggedy Ann. She's real to me. I have sea monkeys, but they're not fully grown yet. My cat's name is Mississippi. I don't have a dad. Boy, I keep doing this one puzzle over and over, and I never get tired of it. I guess it's good, though, because I don't have any friends. <laughs> uh, joking aside, I'm so honored to be here tonight, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for a number of people. I'd like to thank the Writers' Trust 
and the Metcalf Foundation for their incredible work on behalf of artists, to my fabulous agent, um, Hillary McMahon, Kathy Lowinger, you gave me my first shot, you're here somewhere tonight, you brought me into the Tundra family with a little book called Word Nerd, and um, I've been there ever since. Uh, Tara Walker, who is my own Ursula Nordstrom, the jurors, Susan Perrin, Keo McClear and Glenn Hooser. Um, I'm going to have to really get them drunk uh, one of these days. Um, and finally, to my mom, Eleanor, who is also here tonight. She raised me on her own. And contrary to what you may think after hearing my diary entries, she wasn't one of those parents who told me I was special or that everything I wrote was genius. Um, she was simply there. She never said, you're crazy or you need a plan B. She just let me carve my path and learn from my own mistakes, of which there were plenty. And while we never had a lot of money for extras, we always had the two most, most important things in our household, and that was unconditional love and books. Thank you. To present tonight's third career award, the Latiner Writers Trust Poetry Prize, please welcome the Griffin Prize and Neustadt Prize nominated author and juror for this year's prize, Huang Win. Hello. Poetry, as you know, is a classic art form that in the hands of its most skilled practitioners speaks to the concerns of the contemporary while continuing a conversation with the past. Canada has produced its share of exceptional poets and poetry has contributed deeply to this country's literary identity. We are proud to present this unique award which celebrates one poet's contribution to this legacy through an entire body of work. As much as this $25,000 prize is in recognition of past work, it is equally symbolic of our anticipation for work to come. I'd like to thank the Latner Family Foundation both for creating and funding this prize and for their commitment to advancing and celebrating remarkable voices in Canadian poetry. It was a pleasure to be on this year's jury. My fellow juror, Margot Wheaton, and I took great pride and delight in reading the work of Canada's finest poets. It was a pleasure to work with Margot and a privilege to take on this task to honor a member of the Canadian poetry community. Through six collections of poems, the poet we award this prize to tonight has, has achieved something remarkable, an invigorating body of work that convincingly addresses both the urgency of the present moment and the long echoes of our historical and lyrical past. In disrupted language, simultaneously unsettled and musical, he passionately investigates subjects as diverse as the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, John Clare and the English countryside, the increasing disappearance of public space, and in a hauntingly beautiful sequence, the death of his sister from cancer. The depth and scope of his vision is startling and impressive, and so are the courage, precision, and care he brings to the poems he creates. In this year's winner, we find a poet ferociously hitting his stride. We're looking forward with eagerness to what comes next. The winner of the 2019 Latner Writers Trust Poetry Prize is Stephen Collis. Oh, 
that was torture. I don't, I don't know anything worse than listening to someone talk about you and you're like, shut up, shut up, I don't want to hear anymore. Um, I've had weeks to let this sink in and it has not sunk in. Um, I remain really honored and really shocked and, and not certain how to proceed. Um, so I'll just start by thanking uh, way too many people. But thank you to the Writers' Trust. Thank you to the, the jurors. Um, thank you to the Latner Family and Foundation for their generosity. Uh, and congratulations to all the other nominees and award recipients tonight. Uh, I have to thank my, my family right off the top. Um, Kathy, Hannah, Sophie, and Joshua. We're, we're all more or less adults now. I might be in the rear, but uh, they're, they're like my best friends, and that's, I couldn't ask for anything more. Um, there's so many writers I would love to thank, and, and my dear friend, the British poet David Hurd, is in my, my thoughts right now, but I, I'm gonna stick to my, my West Coast community um, and the uh, unceded territories I'm uh, very honored to live upon of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. Uh, we've got a great community. Writing can be so solitary and, and uh, frustrating, but we all know you need a community to write with and through, so thanks to, to Fred Waugh and Daphne Marlatt, to Cecily Nicholson and Rita Wong and Mercedes Eng and Jordan Abel and Jordan Scott and so many others. Thanks to my writer colleagues at SFU, Clint Burnham, Jeff Dirksen, and David Cheriandi, who I cannot imagine with that long beard and staff, um, but I would love to see him try and, and grow that. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm going to uh, just read a very short poem to, to close this off. And, and I'm going to be a little profane, so I'll apologize for that. But the, the profanity here is under the aegis of, of William Blake's notion that perhaps the uh, road of excess does lead to the palace of wisdom. Uh, and this, this might seem like I'm throwing shade at poetry, but it's really a, a love poem to poetry. Fucking poetry. <laughs> I have given you everything, the ache of each arcing Curl, slash, and curve of letter form, forming words from mere sounds as round and round anxiety. You whispered, more and more anxious. Go, you are healed, you are free, go. Fucking poetry. And where are we now? In the long silence of not reading, we create in our writing minds, texting, nothing but invisible wind bodied forth in outflung boughs of electric currents. I'm a sucker forever for the wallflower, for paths diverging in snowy woods, and the sharp cry of the killdeer, the merest whisper, you are poetry, fucking poetry. Fucking poetry, even in the apocalypse, you are writing me, because this is what people did the last apocalypse too. Singing into the fires which keep some few remaining coals glowing long into the aftermath, the shattered night we sing through and so we go on singing because we are poetry too. This is all we have, poetry. Fucking poetry. Uh, I forgot one thing, and it's the biggest thing in a lot of ways. Thank you. Thank you. And that's to thank my dear friend Phyllis Webb. And I can't help thinking of her and, and because I'm, we're standing in the CBC. And in 1965, Phyllis Webb was one of the founders of the CBC radio program Ideas, which is still going, and Phyllis is still going at 92 years old and uh, living alone on her island off the coast. And I called her a few days ago to tell her I was getting this award. When you're 92, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring or if it's going to bring. So I wanted to share this with her because I knew she'd be excited and happy. So in a lot of ways, I am definitely sharing this with Phyllis Webb. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. To present tonight's fourth and final career award, please welcome a three-time Writers' Trust Prize winner, right? Like, so what? Who cares? Um, <laughs> never heard of this person. And the recipient of last year's Engel Finley Award, Elisa York. Give it up. I care. The career awards given by the Writers' Trust are unique in their mission. 
to celebrate voices that represent the depth and diversity of Canadian talent book after book after book. These are rewards for literary excellence, but also for stamina, spirit, and artistic growth in a rewarding but exacting profession. That means hard. <laughs> it is a particular honor to present the Writers' Trust Ingle Finley Award, which recognizes a writer of fiction in mid-career. While this award comes with a prize of $25,000, it is equally important in its endorsement of this author's craft and courage. May it long be a source of encouragement to tonight's winner. Before I reveal this year's winner, I would like to thank my fellow jurors, Peter Behrens and Paul C. Sequasis. Together we read the best that contemporary Canadian literature has to offer. I thank my fellow jury members for the thoroughness and thoughtfulness they brought to their reading and decision. This year's winner of the Engel Finley Award is as clear-eyed and fearless a writer as this country has known. Book after book, he descends into the darkness, returning with a story we require. How does he survive it? <laughs> How do we? through his humanity, evident in the compassion that runs like a subterranean stream under even the most brutal of his scenes, through his humor, though it often undoes you, even as it yields relief. Most importantly, through his art. No matter how troubling the tale, he delivers the essential solace of the unerring line. But what of redemption, of hope. Ultimately, his novels offer up something wilder and more elemental. Call it life force, if you will. Call it love. My fellow book lovers, please join us in celebrating the winner of the 2019 Engel Finley Award, Rawi Haj. <laughs> I'm still in the Montreal style, we kiss French way. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. I'm afraid I, uh, I get carried away and wrote longer speech than I intended, but it was one of those good writing days <laughs> where you think you have much to say. Um, so uh, be patient with me. Um, it's an honor to be here. I feel like uh, I'm a regular here. Uh, after four nominations to this fiction, to the Fiction Prize, and always being ecstatic for the other winners, <laughs> I must say I had my doubts tonight till the last minute. A few years ago, I walked into the Chinese embassy in Ottawa to get a visa for a trip to China. The clerk behind the window asked me, what's your profession? And I said, I'm a writer. What kind of writer? I'm told that I'm a rebellious kind, I said. <laughs> the clerk was clearly alarmed at this and asked me if I would be seeing anyone during my visit. I said, sir, that's inevitable. Uh, we both smiled, and he took a long look at my face, and then he proceeded to give me the visa. I have often wondered about the bureaucrat and our encounter. I have wondered if he made an exception for me because he approved of my humor, or because he was a nationalist who was acknowledging that I would be attentive to the demographics and the nuances of his country. Whatever the case, this exchange had led me to think about the notion of unexpected 
encounters and their meaning to a writer and to each of our lives. The memory of an encounter, like all memories, is selective, arbitrary, and possibly even false. When I consider or imagine my first encounter with my mother, I recall seeing her fear uh, during a bombardment in Beirut. Sorry. And throughout the years since, part of what I always seen in her is a worried mother who loves her children. My first encounter with my father, as I recall it, was the moment he handed me a novel worthy of an adult's imagination. This was an act of trust, an acknowledgement of my capacity to understand, value, and value the imagination. From this encounter, I grew, I grew to learn about the complexity of a great literary work and the essence of rebellion that exists in the imagination. My encounter with my partner, Madeleine Thien, was one of these generous gifts that life bestows on you when you least deserve it. The visa she gave me was the visa for life. I'm grateful to the following people. The Writers' Trust for your good work and for this beautiful acknowledgement of our efforts. The jury for this award, thank you for reading my books and tolerating my profanities. My family in its entirety, including those who are in Beirut now, taking part in a just, peaceful, secular, and humane revolution. I'm grateful to my publisher and editor, Lynn Henry, uh, first at Anansi, uh, now at Knopf Canada, for her brilliance, sensibility, and understanding of the essence of a rebellion and its roots in a controlled madness. I'm grateful to my agents at Wiley, Charles, Buchan, and Sarah Shelfand. And I remain grateful to all the people at Anansi who gave me that first chance and who pulled my manuscript from slush pile. And last but not least, I'm grateful for my encounter with this great nation of ours, Canada. But I also know that a nation state's first encounters with other nations often builds on injustices and violence, and our nation is no exception. Recognizing this is a responsibility for all of us and our path toward justice for the First Nations must be unequivocal and uncompromising. So too should we move towards justice for the many other communities among us who have been subject to exclusion and discrimination. Finally, I hope you will indulge me as I flash this small banner that is currently prominent in the revolutionary street of Lebanon. Uh, I can't help by feeling apologetic, uh, but proud nevertheless of what's happening there. I show this banner and it says, Kilun uh, Yani Kilun, in support of every person in this world who is standing against economic injustice, oppression, and violence, and for the rebellious imagination as it moves towards justice. Thank you very much. Looks like a lot of fun to present an award, and I'd like to now get in on the act myself and present the evening's next honor, the Writers Trust McClellan and Stewart Journey Prize. For more than three decades, the Journey Prize has been introducing the, to readers the next generation of literary talent in this country. The authors nominated this year are exceptional and represent some of Canada's most exciting emerging voices. Each year, McClellan and Stewart publishes the Journey Prize Stories, an anthology of 12 stories that include tonight's finalists. I encourage you to go get your copy because the authors included in its pages today are poised to be the stars of tomorrow. 
I can say this with certainty, having read all 90 prize submissions and having loved and admired these gems. I was fortunate enough to serve on this year's jury, and I'd like to thank my fellow jurors, Carly Baker and Joshua Whitehead. They are amazing, insightful readers and generous, warm colleagues. That's also like our band photo. <laughs> We're gonna hit the road next month. Check us out on Instagram. <sighs> Finalists, it even says here, momentary pause as the screen images show photos of jurors. Um, finalists each receive $1,000 and an incalculable boost to their confidence and career, and tonight's winner receives $10,000. All this was made possible by James A. Michener, an American author of fictional family sagas who, by making the generous donation of his Canadian royalty earnings from his 1988 novel, Journey, established what has become 31 years later a pillar of support to emerging writers in this country. The finalists for the 2019 Journey Prize are Kai Conradi for Every True Artist, the story of an aspiring artist who gets more than she bargained for when she signs for, up for a residency at a roadside motel, published in the Malahat Review. The sock just came off of this microphone, okay. Oh, it's just stripping from me. Angelique Lalande for Puka, which tells of a carpet collector who reimagines his family's fractured history by weaving new tapestries to tell their tale, published in Prism International. and Samantha Jade McPherson for The Fish and the Dragons, the story of a young Chinese fisherman who, after years of toiling to pay off a debt that has devastated his family, makes a magical catch that will change the course of his life. Published in The Fiddlehead. <laughs> to all three finalist winners, congratulations. And the winner of the 10,000 Journey Prize is Angelique Lalonde for Puka, published in Prism International. pretty nervous. I think that's normal. Um, I have a lot of uh, thank yous to make. My first thank yous are to my mother, Nicole Lalonde and Guy Champagne, um, and to my sisters. Uh, the family I grew up in gave me many, many stories to think about for many lifetimes, and I'm grateful for that and for the books that they shared with me as a young person. I'm thankful to my partner, Lyndon, who's at home right now with my two small children, Philomène and Louvelle. Um, I am thankful for the territory of the Gitsan people, where I live and learn in much humility every day. Um, I'm thankful to my uh, supportive readers, Fabienne Calvert-Filteau, uh, Suzanne Ross, and Trudy Lynn Smith and to my very good friend, Sharita Warner, who came with me here today to support me. I am thankful to the jurors. Um, it is such an honor uh, to have my work read by people who I admire and whose words have brought me so much. Um, it's really uh, an honor. I'm thankful to um, the Writers' Trust for supporting writers and for giving this space. It's a remarkable um, place to be. I'm thankful to be included amongst the other writers who were long-listed and short-listed. Um, your stories are wonderful, and I look forward to reading more of your work. And there's probably more, but um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.
We had to practice safe microphone. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> um, it's so lonely back there, like I'm, I'm all by myself. <laughs> I have to make jokes in my head. Um, <laughs> Before we present our next award, the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, we'd like to give you an opportunity to learn more about the five finalists and their nominated books. Days by... Days by Moonlight started off being a kind of town novella or dream story. I think what turned it into a travel narrative was Alfred, the narrator. Once I knew that his parents had died and that he had broken up with someone who was important to him, it felt like he needed to work things out. And in a way, the best way to do that is to travel. It felt natural to go towards the South of Ontario where I grew up and to imagine it as being like a Stations of the Cross where the soul of the country and the soul of the individual kind of intermingle. As I spoke about my heartbreak, Mr. Henderson held his teacup immobile before him, the porcelain vessel like a dollhouse cup between his thick thumb and index finger. When I finished speaking, he was overcome by emotion. He began to cry. It made for an odd sight, a muskox in pajamas, sitting quietly as his tears fell, riveted by his own emotions. I wanted to try my best to give readers a picture of the now, of what it is to be old. The younger people can't quite conceive of elderly people as real, live human beings with the same mind, heart, spirit, psyche as everybody else. While we look decrepit, in fact, inside we are vitally and hugely and humanly alive. That was the main thing I wanted to express in these stories. But somehow or other, the burner was on, the blue and yellow flames warming her and lighting up even the dark corner where previously Reuben had sat. She sighed, gazing into the darkness out the window one more time, although she could see only the wrinkled visage of a very old woman, and then put the magazine's pages to the fire. The Innocence is a book about an orphaned brother and sister in 18th century Newfoundland living in an isolated cove and trying to survive. For me, going through adolescence, it almost felt like another creature took up residence within me, who was me and not me. And part of the confusion and loneliness of that period was trying to figure out who exactly I was. It really was an attempt just to get into the heads of of two characters wrestling with those kinds of questions without even having the language to explain to each other or to themselves what was happening to them. Before it was properly light, he pulled back the one ragged blanket and hauled his father's body to the floor, the heels smacking like mallets against the frozen ground. His sister moved to pick up her father's legs, but Everett wouldn't allow it. The man of the house suddenly. You sit there, he said, until I get back.
This is a book about a girl named Lily. She's a kind of like a collection of a bunch of different women um, that I've probably thought of throughout my life or I've just loved throughout my life. I really wanted to consider the way in which we feel boxed sometimes through just stereotypes, I guess, and however people look at us and the way that people react to who we are and how that can affect us personally. I was still feeling buzzed and dragged out. Mother and I sat on the front steps. The night was good and the sky so clear, empty of all its wonders, the voice from the stars, autonomic of the moon. The sky was usually so full this far east of the city, and I seldom missed the opportunity to watch it dissolve. The book from the start was meant to be a love story between sisters, about a relationship between two women, something that would testify to the intensity of emotion in those relationships. There is a kind of falling in love or infatuation, a version of that that you can have with people in your family or your friends. And then there can be heartbreak when things aren't going well or when you have a falling out. And then it can feel so important and so affirming when you get back together. So this was my version of a love story between Robin and Lark. She kept changing the subject with increasingly obvious excuses. And when I asked her directly why she wouldn't talk about it, she only shook her head and said she didn't know what I meant. I'm not telling you anything because there's nothing to tell, she said, and the lie hung in the air between us, a single discordant note in an otherwise harmonious song. Created that. They animated the covers of the books. That was amazing. That's a lot of work. You all don't even care. You just write books. Like, they made it move. All right. Ungrateful. Um, and also, can we also vote on Donald Sutherland and and uh, Andre Alexis somehow doing some kind of voiceover magic together? so that we, you know, I, I don't know, maybe nobody cares, so maybe, okay. I just think that that would be magical and make a lot of money. Um, to present the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, please welcome the Vice President Regulatory Cable at Rogers Communications Canada Incorporated, Pam Dinsmore. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's, a, it's a truly a delight to be here um, on this wonderful evening. It's a great celebration, and I have to say that uh, it's my first time here, but it's an incredibly impressive show. Um, on behalf of Rogers, as you know, we're a leading Canadian communications company. We're very proud to have sponsored this prize for more than two decades, supporting Canadian voices, celebrating Canadian stories, and championing the very best Canadian books. In total, we've been able to deliver, through this prize, more than $1 million to Canadian writers. Before I announce the winner of this year's $50,000 prize, I want to take a moment to recognize this year's prize jury. A profuse thanks to the three jury members for their discerning judgment and tireless dedication. They are Dennis Bach, Michael Kahn, and Suzette Meyer. And once again, as we saw in the video, the finalists are Andre Alexis for Days by Moonlight, published by Coach House Books, Sharon Butala for Season of Fury and Wonder, published by Koto Books. Michael Crummy for The Innocence, published by Doubleday Canada. 
Taya Mutanji for Shut Up You're Pretty, published by Arsenal Pulp Press, and Alex Olin for Dual Citizens, published by House of Anansi Press. Congratulations again to all five authors. And now, the winner of the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize is Andre Alexis for Days by Moonlight. I guess everybody always says when they win these that they don't expect it. And kind of you'd have to be a bit of a dickhead to expect it. Um, but I really didn't expect it. Um, I would like to thank um, my family, my marvelous editor. And uh, I'm sorry, Elaine, I didn't wear a proper shirt. Um, I would thank you all. I'm speechless. Thank you. Before we present this evening's final prize, we'd like to give you an opportunity to learn more about the five finalists for this year's Hillary Weston uh, Writers Trust Prize for Nonfiction. And who better to hear from than the three writers who selected the prize finalists? Let's have a look at what the prize jury said. I think there's a kind of an explosion right now happening in Canadian nonfiction. It seems to be such a such a strong r race right now. Every generation finds its voice in writing, and we're seeing a new one emerge here. I think. I was really humbled by how deep the talent pool is here. Uh, how many really amazing books are being published? What I always look for in a book is a compelling voice. A voice where you feel like this is someone I want to go on a journey with. For me, what made a book really stand out was ultimately the quality of the writing and whether I thought it was a book that I would want to reread. For me, it came down to craft. It came down to craft and it came down to a story that I, I felt like the author had an authentic heart tie to. I think it broke all of our hearts a little bit to have to choose at all, but that was the task we had. Uh, because there was so much that was so good. A Mind Spread Out on the Ground by Alicia Elliott is a collection of essays that are by turns very reflective and personal, but also quite uh, polemical and political. She just puts it all out there and tells it like it is. Uh, still with a great use of words and language, there's kind of this musicality or rhythm. I was pretty humbled by the rawness and the honesty knitted into these, this, this collection of essays. It's a very active reading experience and it's one that leaves the reader really having to think about their own complicity in Canadian policy today. This book was not easy to read, but it wasn't meant to be easy to read. It's a, it's a book that uh, is urgent. You're not meant to be comfortable. Back then, death was all you could see, smell, hear, or taste. Death, death was, was all, all you, you could, could feel. feel. What does that type of mourning, pain, and loss do to you? He asks. We reflect on our own losses, our own mourning, our own pain. We say nothing. After a moment, he answers himself. It creates numbness. Numbness is often how people describe their experience of depression.
Hello, I Want to Die, Please Fix Me by Anna Mailer Paperni is a book about uh, despair and depression and uh, suicidal ideations and, uh, and suicide. It's a book about depression from the inside. Paperni is able to take us really into her own personal struggles and to show us exactly how difficult it can be to, to treat depression. And not just from her personal experience, but she talks to other people who have experienced it. She talks to the scientists who work on them. Just assiduous, deep research. What was notable for me is how much humor and humanity she managed to inject into the narrative. I think that makes the subject, which is a very heavy subject, um, approachable and enjoyable even. It turns into something that's very readable and that readers will connect with and understand. She's able to translate it to the layperson very well. That late September Friday, two days before the attempt, I put, put the, the final, final edits into, into a political feature, feature as sheets of rain thrummed against the wall-wide newsroom window. The nadir that in recent months had begun to engulf me at the end of every story's high was, this time, too deep to clamber out of. I felt scraped empty, nothing left and nowhere else to go. All Our Relations by Tanya Telega is a book documenting the suicide crisis among Indigenous communities in Canada, but also in Scandinavia, Australia, South America. Just looking at it unflinchingly so that it's something that we really sit with, meditate on, and take in very seriously. She never amplifies things unnecessarily. She lets the facts speak for themselves because the facts alone are powerful. As a reader, I felt like I was benefiting from all of the years uh, of thinking that uh, Tanya Talega has put into the issue. All the research is there with this book. The statistics are all there. But n never, not once, does she remove her own heart from her approach to uncovering the, the story. She just is one of those voices that is so authoritative. To read this book is to have your eyes opened. Ed tells me that some people have suffered so much they disappear into the bush and, and never, never come, come back. back. This act is symbolic of taking one's life. It disrupts the rhythm of life because everyone born on Turtle Island has their path set for them, he says, and the choice to end your life is not yours to make. It is the Creator's. The Art of Leaving by Ayala Tsubari is it's a book about, about loss, it's a book about yearning, it's a book about seeking home, there's this beautiful sort of architecture to the book. It's very artfully crafted in, in its overall structure and also sentence to sentence is a beautiful read. She's one of the most honest nonfiction voices I've read in a long time. She just is able to, you know, not reduce the experience to just one thing or the other, but to allow for the full complexity of her experience. She compassionately unpacks and descri describes her, her own uh, imperfection in a, in a way that, um, that really moved me as a, as a fellow human, trying to figure it all out. Hylet Zabari's The Art of Leaving stayed with me for days, maybe weeks afterwards. It's, it was a haunting story. I wanted, I wanted to know what she'd do now. What, you know, what's happening to her now? For years, my affair with Canada remained as casual, casual and, and non-committal as my romantic entanglements. I owned next to nothing, so I could pick up and leave at a moment's notice. Lived in apartments furnished with milk crates I'd covered with sarongs. Slept on foamy mattresses thrown on the floor. Home was transient, constantly shifting. Older Sister, Not Necessarily Related, by Jenny Hyejun Wills, is a memoir of the author as an adult going back to Korea to reconnect 
with her family that she lost when she was adopted at the age of nine months. One of the things I loved about this book is how she took sort of your standard memoir and almost exploded it and then put it back together differently. I was riveted all the way through and the book just became more and more moving and beautiful. It's magnificently poignant. She writes the book with this sensitive, graceful approach to difficult issues. It was like emotional surgery, parts of that book. You know, very exact, micro stories almost, but fit together very artfully. You feel like you're participating and discovering as you go, as it, as it unfolds. So it's, a, it's revealed with such, um, such a, a light hand and such great craft that the, the book's just tremendous. She tried, my own knee, to love me despite all the disloyalty that went into my making. But in the end, we had, had nothing, nothing to, to hold, hold on, on to. to. And although there's even less between us now, I still whisper stories to her into the sky, fallen eyelashes and dandelion fluff, confessions and prayers, to an older sister, related but not really wishes that, one day, everything will be forgiven. You just write. All you do is write. So she served as a 26th Lieutenant Governor of Ontario-led Renaissance ROM, serves on the board of the Aga Khan Museum, and is a founding patron and chair emeritus of Prince's Trust Canada. She was appointed a member of the Order of Canada in 2003 and was invested by the Queen as a commander in the Royal Victorian Order in 2015 to present the final prize of the evening. Please welcome the Honourable Hilary Weston. Well, good evening, everybody. And I'm delighted to be here tonight as it marks the ninth time I've had the pleasure of announcing the winner of Hilary Weston's Writer's Trust Prize for nonfiction. In each of the first three years of this prize, we had four men and only one woman on the finalist list. This has evolved over time, and for the first time ever this year, we have a short list that is all women. It's always a privilege to celebrate the work of Canada's finest writers of real stories through this prize, and to help these exemplary works of nonfiction find readers in Canada and beyond. Each of the narratives documented by our five finalists tonight is extraordinary. Some of these works of nonfiction hold a mirror up to our lives and to ask hard questions. Some drill deeply into our pol political landscape and others take us on journeys to faraway lands. Though each book is different, all of the authors share exceptional literary talent and have enriched our lives through their research and their discovery. I'd also like to recognize the prize jurors who approached their work with thoughtful attention. In selecting this, this year's very best Canadian nonfiction, they have chosen remarkable titles, and the task in selecting a winner could n not have been an easy one. And on behalf of the Writers' Trust of Canada and myself, thank you, Ivan Coyote, Trevor Harriet, and Manjushri Thapu. And once again, the finalists are Alicia Elliott Anna Murlo-Papurni 
for, hello, I want to die, please fix me, Depression in the First Person, published by Random House Canada. <laughs> Tanya Talaga, Our Relations, Finding the Path Forward, published by Doubleday Canada. Ayelet Sabari, For the Art of Leaving, a memoir published by HarperCollins Publishers. <laughs> Jenny, Jenny Heejun Wills, For Older Sister, Not Necessarily Related, published by McClelland and Stewart. Congratulations again to all five finalists. Wow, here it is. <laughs> the winner of the 2019 Hilary Weston's Writers Trust Prize for Nonfiction. The wrong envelope. <laughs> and the winner is Jenny Hijun Wills. <laughs> Your older sister, not necessarily related. to walk on stage with these shoes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm shaking. Um, I genuinely am unexpecting of this. Um, thank you so much to the Writers' Trust. Thank you, Hilary Weston. Um, thank you to the jurors. Alicia Ayelet. Tanya, Anna, thank you. Um, thank you to my families. Some of you are here tonight. Some of you are far away. Some of you um, are elsewhere in the world. Um, thank you to my agent, Jackie Kaiser at Westwood Creative and everyone there. Thank you to um, my brilliant editor, Martha Kanya Forstner. I'm McClellan and Stewart. She's a genius. Thank you to everyone at Penguin Random House Canada. Um, I have, I guess, three things to say, and then everyone can go. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I guess, um, is to read BIPOC liter literature which is to say black, indigenous, and other people of color um, writers every day, um, read them every day. Um, second, it's Adoption Awareness Month right now. Um, 
listen to the voices of adopted people and first mothers, um, listen to birth mothers. Um, and third, um, I'm sorry, I'm so nervous. Um, what I'd hope would be an unnecessary reminder that trans rights are human rights. Thank you. almost forgot her check. <laughs> Don't you just hate it when you win an award and then you just forget the check? Um, <laughs> so thank you everyone for coming. And um, it says here, invite everyone to return to the lobby for a post reception with food and drink. Food and drink, everybody. Um, but first, be like, so you, you all go to the lobby, have fun and eat and stuff. And can I just please ha ask all of the winners to the stage for a photograph? And thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.